G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. I want to have a bit of a talk about solder today. Now I've done a soldering tutorial, I'll link to that in the description of this video, but today I want to talk about the actual solder itself and the different types and why we use them because it's really important if you're going to be doing anything in the RC Model hobby these days, you have to know how to solder, you have to choose the right products for the job. And I've got a couple of spools of solder here. I've got a yellow one and an orange one. What's the difference? Well, the colour. No, more than that. Believe it or not, this when the spool is full, it's 200 grams, and this spool is full, and it's only 250. So why such a disparity between the weight of this solder and the weight of that solder? And I'm sure everybody has already worked it out. The difference is lead, because lead's very heavy. Now this is 60-40 solder, and as you can see on the label, 60% tin, 40% lead. That's a really good all-round solder. It's also rosin cord or flux cord as they call it. I don't know if it says flux cord. It doesn't say flux cord, but it is flux cord. It's essential that you get flux cord solder for electrical work. You have to be very careful as well that it's not acid flux cord because acid flux is only used for plumbing and other things where you, know, you can wash away all the corrosive remains of the flux. For electrical work or electronic work, we don't want any acid anywhere near our delicate components or circuit board. So it has to be a flux that is neutral. Uh, which is usually a rosin core or something similar. Now, this solder has got Chinese writing all over it. I bought this from Banggood. They said it was 60-40 solder, and it's not, because look how much you get for your money. It's actually just tin-based solder. And this is the hippie solder, the lead-free, tree-hugging, you know, um, save-the-planet solder, which, to be honest, is absolutely useless in the hands of most amateur solderers. And even some experts like myself, I, I wouldn't use this if you gave it to me. I mean, I spent six bucks on this because I thought it was lead-based, but it's crap, so it's never going to get used. It's just going to get thrown away or just sit on the cupboard in case, I don't know, in case I want to show someone how bad it is, like I'm about to do today. So why is this solder so much better, the stuff with the lead in it? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that, and I touched on those briefly in my soldering tutorial. Now, the first one is that it's much easier to use, much easier to use this solder because it melts and flows far more easily than this rubbish. This stuff here, uh, it, it's pasty, it doesn't give a nice finish, it's, uh, it's uh, really horrible. This alloy of solder, oh, sorry, of tin and lead is an alloy which is what we call eutectic. And that's a big word. All it means basically is that it transitions from a liquid to a solid or from a solid to a liquid very quickly, just a matter of a few degrees, which means if you melt the stuff, it starts running immediately. And when you take the head off, it solidifies immediately. This, however, is a completely different story. This is not eutectic. That means there's quite a broad range of temperatures between when it starts to melt and when it's fully molten and when it starts to solidify and it's fully solidified. That's really bad for electrical work because sometimes if you're soldering wires to plugs, you can't keep the wire still, totally still, while the solder cools for long enough. With this, the cooling of the solder might take half a second or a second at the most. Sometimes the cooling of this, to go from a liquid flowing solder to a solid, can take five or six seconds. And if you move the wire during the time that this is cooling down, you will get a crappy joint called a dry joint. Because what happens is when you move the solder while it's solidifying, you get huge cracks in it, it crystallizes, and you get very poor conduction, very poor conductivity, which means it has a high resistance. And physically, the joint becomes very, very weak, which is not good at all. This is far more forgiving. So. I would rather save my model than save the planet. But realistically, I've had this little spool here for probably, oh, I don't know, four years, and I do a lot of soldering, and it's still got, you know, a couple of layers on it. So it's not like using solder is going to throw a huge amount of lead into the environment if you use lead-based solder. So really, this is just, ah, you know, go, go hug a tree, go save a dolphin or something if you want to do something worthwhile for the planet, but don't ruin your work by using this crappy ass lead-free solder. But enough of that, I'm going to show you the difference, practical demonstration of the difference between this and this when you're trying to solder stuff. Okay, I've got my Heiko iron, the tip is nice and fresh. I'm going to use some leaded solder here and we'll just fill in one of these holes with the leaded solder and you watch what happens as I do it. Let's choose this one, okay? So you can see the solder is flowing really fluidly. See, it's nice and fluid. It's like a liquid. And when I take my iron off, it just, it just as soon as I remove my iron, it just solidifies. There's no pastiness. Um, in fact, it's so liquid, it's so fluid that, look at that, lovely. It's a gorgeous little piece of soldering there. Not a problem at all. But let's switch over to the tin base, the lead-free solder. And I'll do one alongside. You just watch the difference. Now, my iron, as I say, is set to 390 degrees, which is a reasonable temperature. So I'm going to pour the, the lead-based solder in here. Uh, sorry, the lead-free solder in. 
And you notice it's just, it's just not flowing. It's just not flowing. Look, it's pasty. See this? It actually creates a paste. There's a paste I can push out to the side. It's, it's horrible. Look at that. See the pasty bit here? It's awful. Um, and I pour it in and if I try really hard, I can get a half decent. But I mean, look, we've got this pastiness where it's halfway between liquid and solid. and That's awful. So the finished result doesn't look too bad, but even then, um, you can see that the leaded solder is nice and shiny and the lead free, it's kind of dull. It's kind of dull. It doesn't have that luster that the leaded solder has. It's because it's got, it's a lot more crystalline as it cools. I think it's really, really crap. It's bad. So that's why I call it happy solder. And it's really, if you've got the choice, don't use this crappy lead free solder. Lead, when it comes to soldering, is really good for you. It's good for your joints. It's good for your connections. It's wonderful. So there you go. The lead free solder just doesn't flow as nicely. It, it's, it's not eutectic so that it's easier to move the wires while it's cooling and get a horrible pasty mess. And yeah, generally all around not as good to use. There's another issue with tin based solder as well, or lead free solder, and that's a thing called tin whiskers. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll see kind of a fuzzy growth around the edges of some of these components. And that's the whiskers of tin that have formed over time when tin is just left on a soldered component. What happens is the metal actually moves. It actually creates crystals of, and transitions of sort of transports itself along those crystals, those crystals of lead can, sorry, of tin can actually grow really long and they can short stuff out. This was a problem that was discovered quite early on in the use of lead-free solder. And that's why for some mission critical applications, they still specify leaded solder rather than lead-free, even though there's all sorts of environmental issues surrounding the use of leaded solder. So, yep, I would say if you're going out there, you want to buy some solder, don't waste your money on the hippie stuff. Get the good stuff, the eutectic 60-40 solder. Now there are other ratios of lead and tin that can be used. One of the most popular ones is, uh, what is it, 63-37. And why would you use 63% tin, 37% lead rather than 60%, 40%? Well, this 60-40 solder is eutectic, but the 63-37 is even more so. It's the most eutectic ratio of tin and lead. So it gives you a solder that really does transition even quicker from solid to liquid and liquid to solid. So sometimes that can be useful. A while ago, you know, going back a few years, it used to be quite common to have copper included in the alloys for your solder. And the reason for that was that way back then, solder tips were often made of pure copper because it conducts heat very well. And the problem with lead and tin when they're melted is that they will dissolve copper very, very slowly. It slowly erodes away at alloys with the copper on the soldering iron tip. And what that happened, what happens then is of course that the Soldering iron tip just basically gets eaten away as the surface layers are alloyed with the solder and then put onto the work you're soldering. So, yep, there are solders still available with a bit of copper in there if you're using copper-based soldering iron bits. And there's even some with a bit of silver. And silver just adds a little bit more to the strength of the joint, a little bit more to the conductivity, although not really much. There's special applications where you would use silver over your yep, straight lead tin solder. But there you go. If you're going to buy solder, buy a decent brand. Don't buy one hung low, you know, or the Nyingtonda Lipo because you get screwed over. <laughs> I've had a bad run recently, got some dud micro SD cards, and Banggood sent me some crap solder instead of the stuff I ordered. Other thing I noticed when I ordered this it was supposed to be 0.8 millimeters, but this is one millimeter. So either they've got stuff in the wrong bin or they check the reviews for this stuff, and everyone's getting one millimeter. Um, lead free solder instead of the 0.8 millimeter tin lead solder they ordered. So uh, is it a rip off? I don't know. I'm not going to bother claiming on it. I mean, God, six bucks or something. It's not worth the effort. But uh, buying good solder, there are a number of brands on the market. You can look around, you'll find stuff that's recommended. I've got this from JCAR here in New Zealand. Uh, JCAR is an Australasian company. They sell hobby stuff, a bit like the old Tandy Radio Shack used to be and Dick Smith Electronic used to be. And this is pretty good stuff. I've used it. It's fine. It's about 20 bucks, I think, for a roll of this. In New Zealand, 20 New Zealand dollars, and this was six US dollars, and, <clears throat> and this is worth much more than that, not only in price, but in the fact that that's good solder. Never mind. So, if you've got questions, comments, anything you want to know about solder, if I can help you out. Oh, before I go, why why did I want 0.8 mil and not one mil? Well, this is 0.7 mil. It's actually nice to have very thin solder because you can control the rate at which you're putting it onto the wires. You get big thick solder, big fat solder, and you can't really control the rate. Also, if you wadge a big fat wire of solder into a joint, it'll suck the heat out of it because the actual fact of the solder melting absorbs a lot of heat. So if you've got a marginal iron on a job, if your iron's not really up to the job and you use a big thick stick of solder, 
the solder joint's going to come out pretty cold. If you use thin solder, you can apply it more gradually and the iron hopefully will keep up with the heat as it's drawn away by the melting process. There you go, solder. Who thought it would be so complicated? Uh, questions, comments, usual place, blah, blah, blah. Now it's time for me to clear the bench, get on and do some soldering. Bye for now.